Welcome everyone. Yep, it's amazing. We have um, been through eight classes together. This is the ninth and the last class, three weeks of instructions. And I think we managed to cover almost two semesters worth of material in a school or university. So it's um, been fast paced and I hope you've been uh, learning a lot. I know it's uh, hard in this kind of environment to learn online. Um, I've tried to keep it in a way where the pace is good and you're learning as much as you can and hope you've had time to try out the examples and the homeworks. I think they just reinforce what we learn in the class. And uh, today uh, is gonna be uh, some summary of um, what we have learned so far. And then um, I'll recap uh, the last class and then um, cover some reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a large topic by itself and it won't be enough for us to cover the whole gamut of it. So I'll give you a kind of an introduction and some directions on where to go to learn more about it. Uh, but it's, it's a fascinating topic in itself and um, something that I am really interested in, but uh, don't have enough time to kind of delve into it fully. So, and then I'll cover some summary and resources on what to do after the class, uh, what happens. Um, we can remain connected um, through uh, different forums that are available online. Um, I know there's been some effort to collect um, emails and create a mailing list of sort. Um, and I also maybe start a Google group that we can all be in and continue our journey of learning. So um, we'll see how this goes. And uh, maybe towards the end of the class, we can all um, enable our videos and we can see each other and uh, say goodbyes and uh, keep learning. All right, so let's um, get started. So some questions from last time. Um, I'll just cover these quickly uh, because some of these answer uh, themselves and because hopefully things were clearer after we did um, the hands-on part. So how are the weights selected for dropout? Is it random, uh, asked by Greg? So it is uh, pretty much random. Um, you can um, either like just use the built-in TensorFlow things and you can just say dropout 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and it will do the right thing uh, where you uh, get rid of some of the weights. And, um, and the main purpose is, um, um, is not, not actually in increasing efficiency because that happens automatically when you drop the weight. But the idea is to um, not learn the network too much, which is like to try to avoid the overtraining. So that is the main purpose of a dropout. Uh, and efficiency is the side gain of it. Um, that's um, some, uh, it's a good practice. So if you have, uh, fewer number of data, um, then you can try to see if dropout works so that you don't overtrain. And um, how are the weights being modified in a GAN? Um, and the second question that is related, what forces the generator diversify? So it's all connected. So we, this is not um, like functions in C++ where you're taking input and giving the input to something else. These things are connected to each other. So what forces it to diversify um, or how the weights are modified is through gradient descent. So because of the loss function that we are trying to minimize, um, we accumulate weight over time. Um, as we go through each batch or each epoch, um, the weights are adjusted slightly. And um, as we go along, the loss function kind of forces the generator to converge to whatever the loss function is forcing it to. So that's the general idea in all of the networks actually. So nothing is um, fixed. We are not saying that this particular node has to be like this, but um, over time as because things are connected and because of the way loss function is designed, um, over time the weights do tend to converge to what we want it to. Um, next question from Ivan, uh, how to make sure our discriminator is not too powerful? Um, so we want to make sure neither of them are too powerful, the discriminator or the generator. So um, we didn't do this, but you should um, plot the losses. Plot the losses as you go along the training, and you should see 
uh, that both of them should average around 50%. Um, and when that happens, that is a good equilibrium to have so that neither of them <laughs> is too powerful. Next question is about why use GAN instead of VAE? So um, variational autoencoder, because you can actually get the distribution or an approximation of it and sample from it, it gives you more control uh, in some way. Um, so the reason is that it is, um, the VAE is sort of, you have to break it and then you have to do this additional step of sampling from the distribution and then trying to figure out. With the GAN, it's already fully connected. There is no supervision needed. You can just let it run and it should convert. So that's like more of the preferred way to have most of the networks is that you don't need an intervention after the training. You just keep uh, training it and then you get the image out. So th that's, that's the attractiveness of the GAN is that um, it, um, it's fully formed and then you don't need to do anything else. Uh, next question is what can you generate 3D objects? So 3D objects are hard because the space, um, you add one more dimension and your space increases dramatically. So the kinds of things you can do um, with the neural network, the representation of 3D objects in a matrix form becomes harder. There have been attempts um, more recently about how to uh, better represent 3D objects as uh, matrices and how we can feed them and uh, still uh, an ongoing topic of research. Uh, there have been attempts um, in a different way where you can approximate a 3D object from a photograph, and that has seen a lot of progress. Um, and just a recent paper where it can generate a full 3D object from uh, images, and that's pretty popular now, and uh, I think that you'll see more of that in the future. Uh, Another question about RNN, uh, are they useful for generating videos? Uh, yes, definitely. So RNNs can be used to generate videos. Anything that is time dependent, you can use um, uh, some kind of an RNN, uh, not a basic RNN. I think they have a little bit lost favor in favor of um, the gated, R, um, the gated uh, recurrent unit that we had. So, so that's probably the thing to use. Uh, but you can also use, uh, for generating videos, you can use images as sequences, and there is no reason to uh, just give one image at a time to your neural network. You can give it a stack of images. So internally, everything is a matrix. So if you stack, say, uh, two images, uh, back to back, it's a six dimensional thing, and then you can um, feed it and the ground truth would be your intermediate image. So you can in effect do this frame interpolation um, by a regular CNN as well. Last question, and does it matter what algorithm we use to convert text to numbers? So it, it doesn't really matter. So I think we chose the easiest one, which is just the index um, from zero to N, but you could use anything. So one thing you wanna make sure is that because the um, letters are uh, unique, um, you want to be able to get back to the letter. So it's best to use integers and not floating point because you'll have some uh, floating point error, uh, things would change. So you may want to um, use some kind of an integer index. So to treat the letters like uh, enums in uh, programming where everything corresponds to some kind of an integer. All right, so that was the questions and uh, we'll go over and uh, uh, look at other questions if they come in. So just to recap what the RNNs were from last time, um, it is um, something that is useful for time dependent data. And we saw uh, an example where we tried to predict what a Shakespearean style would be. And uh, it did pretty well. It uh, started from gibberish and uh, started making some uh, Shakespeare like or from that particular play it started making some sense. And if you had trained it for longer, uh, it would probably start generating something that looks like Shakespeare. It wouldn't be as good probably, but uh, still pretty nice to be able to do that. So um, it's um, very popular to use these in all kinds of like um, something like um, Siri or Google Translate, all of these use some kind of a recurrent neural network. And we went over what these look like and uh, uh, we unroll this and when we specify in TensorFlow, 
a number of recurrent units. So when we say 256 um, or 1024 in our case, this gets unrolled into that many units. So that's, this is the number of units that will get unrolled into internally. Uh, so just by a single call, when you say 256, it gets ro unrolled into 256 units like this. So uh, what is happening essentially is that you're passing um, data from previous time step onto the next uh, node and so on. So then when it's, everything is connected, then um, at least for this 256 uh, sequence of data points, um, they're all kind of dependent on each other in some way or the other. So today we are going to cover uh, something called uh, reinforcement learning. And you may have heard about it or um, seen examples of it. Um, so it's a field um, related to uh, neural networks, but only tangentially. Uh, the idea is that you have an environment and um, you, uh, in your environment, there are a bunch of states and you perform an action um, there are a set of possible actions that you could take in the environment and um, you get a reward for each action. And the goal is to maximize the total reward. So in this example, uh, the maze is your environment and um, there are possible states where you can be near one of these cells where, um, and the actions are, you can go forward, backward, left or right. And um, after you take each of those actions, you may be given some reward. So when you are in a state, say in time t, the agent um, is given an option to choose one of the actions. And once they take an action, you say starting from this point in red, uh, you take an action to move forward. You may be given a reward, um, say a positive reward for moving this way, maybe a negative reward for moving backwards. So then um, you, repeat and try to take successive actions. And um, at uh, each state, uh, you, when you take an action, you get a reward and you move on to the next state and so on and so forth. So you repeat it uh, millions of times and um, the goal is to collect these rewards and maximize the total reward. So that's the uh, setup um, in a reinforcement learning um, uh, environment. So everybody clear on what reinforcement learning does? So, so this is a simple example, but all reinforcement learning uh, is set up in this way. So let's uh, take a little bit of a deeper look on what things are. Um, so essentially you have to um, set up actions and states. So in simple environment like this, it's easy to tell what the actions are, possible actions and what the states are. In a complex environment, it may be a little bit hard because there may be too many influences in the environment. If you take a complicated game, um, then the number of possible actions are too many. And that's uh, one of the challenges is how to keep that action list small enough, uh, but you can still specify a full environment. And the number of states that you can be in after taking an action, that can also grow. So, so that's one of the challenges of like setting up an environment like this. And another one is to how to set up a model. So this uh, has to be mathematically expressed somehow the environment, like what happens when you take a step, uh, where do you end up? Uh, so that has to be modeled in somehow. And that's another part that is challenging for a complex environment. So, so we said that we would get a reward for each step, but uh, our goal is to maximize total reward. So, so we need a policy of, um, how do we take an action or which action do we take uh, at each step uh, when presented with the list of possible actions? So that's called a policy. And the policy should maximize not the immediate next step reward, but it should be able to uh, maximize the overall reward. So that the how you do that um, is uh, something called a value function. So I want to differentiate between reward and value. So reward is the immediate reward of taking the next action and value function is um, uh, something that kind of represents an overall total reward. The good um, representation of that is um, maybe an average of an ongoing average of the total reward. So that um, is a good representation of value. So 
Uh, so now we have uh, more idea about like how to set up the environment and what these things are. Um, another thing to um, just to reiterate that all this comes from uh, how humans learn. If you look at uh, a baby learning to walk and um, there is some inherent um, value in having a baby uh, learn to walk despite all the challenges, despite falling hundreds and thousands of times in that learning process. So the immediate reward is not um, maybe positive, but maybe there is some inherent value in learning, in learning to be able to walk. And in fact, um, the genetic setup is so uh, rewarding of that overall value that uh, it trumps all these small little pains and aches that baby gets and the possibility of falling. So, so just to differentiate between value and reward again, um, the overall value may be uh, of something that you don't realize. It's similar to like when you are say, have an exercise regime and um, day to day, you may think of it as a painful process maybe, and you don't want to, maybe the good reward is to sit on the couch and watch TV. But if you look at the value that you would get from exercising daily to your overall health, you can overcome that initial uh, resistance and then uh, maybe exercise and you get an overall value from the exercise. So, so that's how things are set up. It's trying to mimic a, a real life learning process. So it's a very powerful technique, uh, simply expressed, but very hard to set up. So we will do a simple um, example of this and we'll try to code it all up. So we um, will do something called an n arm bandit problem where you are given N machines. Um, we will use N uh, 10, basically uh, 10 machines. Uh, they're kind of slot machines. So at any given time, you are asked to take an action and that action is simple, that you pull, um, pull the lever of one of these machines, um, that's all the action you need to take. And the machine will give you a reward and you don't know beforehand what the reward is going to be. So then you're trying to maximize your reward by choosing which machine to pull next. So, and then you can do multiple trials of this experiment. And each machine um, has a fixed reward, but that is not known to you. So, so that's the main dilemma It's like, I don't know what this machine is going to give me, but I still want to maximize my play across all these machines. And uh, all you know is that machine has a fixed reward, fixed in the sense it may be up and down, but it's uh, averages to some amount. So that's, that's the setup for, uh, this kind of problem and it's a classic problem. It's very useful to understand how um, reinforcement learning works. So we'll start from this uh, basic example. So here's the setup. So we're given 10 choices for action and each action has a fixed reward that is unknown to us. Fixed in the sense that the reward varies from uh, action to action, but um, uh, it's fixed around a mean. So each machine has a mean fixed reward. And our goal is to maximize total reward over the number of actions. So looking at it more graphically, and this is the setup. <clears throat> so you got these 10 machines and um, these are, um, each have a reward and I put the mean value of the reward in numbers. And just to uh, kind of emphasize that these rewards are averages of uh, what the machine will give you, which means they are actually distributed around that average. So, <clears throat> sorry, the first machine uh, has an award of 80, uh, but at any given time when you pull the lever, you may get 80, you may get uh, zero, uh, you may get 100 or 200 even if you, uh, it's possible. So, but on average, you will get something around 80. So similarly, all the other machines are configured in some way like that. So now you are um, given this choice. What do you do? You don't know anything about these numbers. So um, once you go in, um, the first choice is obviously you don't know anything. You are going to take a random choice, guess, and just pull one machine. So let's say we choose this one. You pull it and you get say 95. And what is your next action? <clears throat> 
So we don't know that. What to do in this case, um, maybe uh, because we don't know any better, we can choose another machine at random. So then you would get 40. And um, then you say, oh no, the last one was better. Let me go back to the last machine. And, uh, and then you say, maybe some other machine has a higher one. So you go choose something else at random. So um, you may playing these machines at random. Um, and as you can see, the reward you can expect would be over say 10,000 uh, such actions. You can expect to get an average of all these rewards. Um, and that is, um, that is the naive strategy, right? So um, that's what it would be. Um, we are uh, picking random um, machines at um, every turn. And what would happen is you will get an average reward over our action. So this is how most people go to Vegas and play slots. It's like just pull at random average, you get an average return. Um, but the machines are set up differently. There is no fixed reward. And in fact, you lose money most of the time. But in this our hypothetical setup, uh, a, a random strategy would give you an average reward. So um, how do we code this up? And um, let's uh, try to do that and um, open this file if you have access to it. I have uploaded all the files, so it should be there. Um, let's take a look at that. So um, this is not going to use any TensorFlow or anything. It's just imported here, but um, we're going to use pure Python and NumPy to do this. Um, so first thing to do is set up our scenario. So what I'm going to do is um, take um, 10 samples from a random distribution. Uh, this will set up our reward setup. And um, then we will um, also create some kind of a probability or standard deviation setup for uh, these uh, rewards. So what I've done here is set up this rewards table. So I got this um, mean rewards all randomly chosen for each of the machines. And then I've also chosen some standard deviation also randomly to um, set up the variation so that then these rewards are not fixed at 66, but it has a standard deviation of five, which means uh, it can range from 61 to 71, right? So, and so on for each of these. So let's execute that. So now we want to set up a reward. Um, so this is when we start the experiment, we will create one so that if you, um, essentially pull the levers on all the machines at the same time, you would get this answer. So every time you run this, you will get a slightly different answer, but they'll all be around the mean. So I'm gonna keep running this again and again. So that's what is going to happen when you pull the slots. Um, so, so everybody good with the setup, right? So it's simple, um, mostly using NumPy and Python. So it's, um, uh, it's a clean setup, exactly mimicking what we had in our drawing. So now we have a random strategy. So we're gonna run a thousand trials and we're gonna keep track of everything, what is happening here. And uh, for each of the trials, we are going to create a reward set, which is um, one of these things. And um, this will tell us what the awards are. And we are going to choose at random one of the actions. So we're going to choose one of the 10 actions. And we'll keep track of everything. We'll keep track of which action we took, um, what the reward we got. And not only that, we will keep track of what is the maximum award we could have gotten. So um, in this case, we, we could have gotten 76. And we'll keep track of that also. So what is the maximum average reward? So all this is just for tracking and looking at how things work. So, and then we'll print all these results. So simple setup, big loop of a number of trials, choose a random action each time and uh, collect the rewards and keep track of all the maximum and average rewards. So let's run this. So, so that was um, our reward table and the standard deviation. So that is the basic setup. and. Um, doing the random actions, we selected these actions. And these are random uh, numbers because we chose random. So this should be a thousand of those. Um, 
And these are the maximum reward actions. So that is uh, what you could have chosen and you would have gotten a lot of rewards, which is um, basically mostly nine and one. So which means the one is this and the nine is this. So we should have ideally chosen one of these two slots, but no, we chose at random and we got those rewards. So, so random average over time is something we particularly keep in track of. So we would kind of slowly go down to the average of all the slots and the maximal would be kind of increasing slowly towards the maximum possible rewards. So in our case, we got this total reward of that and the average reward was this. So we pretty much um, got the average. So if you run for longer, you can see that it will converge to the average. And the maximum possible reward was um, uh, pretty high. We almost got like half of it. So it's not an optimal strategy. It is a strategy when you don't know anything, you just choose randomly. So let's plot this uh, results. So as you can see, um, in the random strategy, you started somewhere and you picked at random. So you see all this jitteriness going on because of the random nature. Um, rewards go up and down, um, but um, we're not getting any closer to the maximum possible. So in the maximum possible, it settles down pretty quickly because there's only one or two possibilities of the high rewards, even, because, um, even though they are um, distributed normally. So ultimately it settled down to either choosing one or nine. So it's pretty much a nice clean straight line here. Whereas our average strategy is jumpy, but uh, never goes above the average. So, so that's um, the idea. So now let's look at, can we make this a better strategy? So, so Another strategy we can try is uh, something called a greedy strategy where we keep, um, keep tally. So we don't know beforehand what the awards are going to be, but we know after the fact. So we can keep a table of sorts with us and we can say, let's choose um, the slot which has the maximum current average. So that would be a greedy strategy. So if um, um, if I, so first thing you can do is you have no choice but to pick randomly the first reward. So you're gonna pick this say 33 and um, it's actually a better thing. I did prepare this table so we can start trying it out. So in the greedy strategy, say for example, you pick this and you get a reward of 40. And next time, so we'll keep a running track of all the averages. So average for this particular slot is zero, 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 right? So next choice you have um, is um, like you're being uh, greedy. So you see the average is um, 40. So you still take this. But this is the one with the highest average. So you take this again and you may get like um, say 10 this time. So 10 plus 40 is 30 and average is now 15. And um, so you keep track of all the averages. So, so this was, um, you, So you, this gave you 40 and um, this gave 30. This is an out, outlier event, so this got you zero. Okay, so these are the rewards you got for each of those, right? So then you can see that, oh, um, the average reward for 40 is the highest. So you can pick um, this slot again, right? So these are all because you can get any number around this number uh, with some standard deviation. Say you got this as the roll of the dice. And so now you're gonna say, 
hey, uh, uh, this is my maximum. I'm going to choose this slot again. And you get um, 15 this time, uh, or say 30 this time. So then the average of 40 plus 30, that, that you can take an average. Say this time you got 80. So 80 plus 30 is 120. You got 60 as an average. Say for this slot, you got 10 now, and 10 plus 6 is 16. The average is 8. And say for this one, you got 30 again. 30 plus 30 is 30. Average 30. This one, say you got 100 now. So 100 plus 112. Um, and uh, that's uh, 55. So 56 is the average. And say you got zero again, So and so on. So next time you'll see that, hey, this has the highest average. Uh, then you're going to pick this slot. So, so basically, you are trying to um, jump around, uh, picking the most, um, the slot with the most highest average. So as you go along, so this kind of is a better strategy because then it allows you to kind of uh, take a peek at um, the slot that is giving you the highest average. Uh, it still is not optimal, but it is better than uh, the average uh, or, or the random strategy. So, so that's good. So it might happen that you might get stuck, like if you get unlucky, you might get stuck at some um, like initial numbers matter. So because this was fairly high and you got stuck at this and because the, all the others were low, so you, it's possible that you may get stuck at, um, um, at some bad um, initial start state. Um, so then there is another strategy which is called uh, greedy epsilon and which um, essentially is um, exploit and explore. So we do the same thing as the greedy strategy, but once in a while we choose another action randomly. So, so this is a common thing where you're doing oil exploration, you have multiple sites to explore. Um, so you're not going to just start digging at the one site that gave you, say, initial minerals. You are going to try once in a while to kind of go and explore some other site as well, because that might have even more minerals. We don't know that beforehand, but you can dig a little bit and in different areas and then try to find out uh, what that might be. So um, in 90% of the cases, you find that maximal, you stick to it, and once in a while, you go out and explore a little bit. So that's exploit and explore. And that is, um, um, that's the kind of standard strategy for doing these kinds of things. Um, another thing we can try is once you do explore and exploit, um, you may want to start exploring less as time goes on. Because as time goes on, you would have explored everything and the maximal. Um, output slot would be obvious to you by then. And then there is no need to explore further. Uh, so um, you can uh, then explore less and less as time goes on. So that strategy is called the decaying epsilon greedy strategy. So it's a combination of explore and exploit and slowing down the exploring a little bit over time. So it's similar to the learning rate that you see in um, neural networks that we have. So let's take a look at how that is done. So we're gonna implement the epsilon greedy strategy here. Um, it's the same kind of setup, um, except now we are going to keep track of, um, of the average reward that every action has. Uh, in this uh, table, something called a Q table. So the Q table is the value table that we will uh, uh, keep track of. And Q is a historical term that comes from. Um, and everybody uses that Q table or some kind of a Q um, notation for that. So um, it's a very similar setup. Um, same thing. We are going to choose an action. Um, and um, it will be random some of the times, but uh, mostly it will be exploiting, right? So um, if we are gonna use a Q table, then uh, we are going to take the maximum of the average we have accumulated so far in the Q table and um, 
once in a while we are going to choose um, a random explore strategy. So how often we choose that um, explore strategy is dependent on this factor we are adding called epsilon. So we're going to choose uh, some epsilon and based on that uh, we are going to explore. So as you can see, if epsilon is one, this is the same strategy as random, right? So if the epsilon is one, we are not going to choose um, the average at all. We're always going to choose at random. So let's uh, do that first um, as an example, where we have uh, no explore, only exploit, which is a random strategy. We just do that. And um, the rest of it is just keeping track of all the totals and averages. Um, and once you do that, you can plot it. And um, so you'll see that, that our epsilon greedy is same as the random strategy that we did above. So let's, let's now uh, take a look at, um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm keeping track of here. So. So this Q table, um, the way it is designed, it doesn't have to keep track of every single example or every single trial that we take. It only has to keep track of um, averages per slot and counts per slot. And that is um, actually mathematically, it's amazingly simple and it works out pretty well. So that kind of uh, removes the burden for keeping track on doing a lot of math um, all this is, is only 10 items in here, uh, corresponding to the 10 possible actions. Um, and then we keep a count. So we keep a count and the average for each of these. So, so basically um, the count for each table, uh, each action should be roughly the same uh, in a random strategy and which it is around 1000 for our 10,000 trials. Um, and then the average should be the average, it should converge to um, something like this numbers um, and which it is happening here. So, so that's pretty good, which means our math is correct here. And, uh, and the way we do the Q table, this is a running average. It's a simple iterative average that we are doing and um, it should be straightforward. And each time an action is taken, we implement uh, or we increment its count so that we can have this Q table counts available. So, so you don't need to keep track of every single uh, thing. We are doing that to plot the graphs, but uh, you don't have to. So let's uh, now look at what would happen if we change the epsilon. So what we want is, we want the epsilon to be low, um, which um, let's set it up to 0 0.01. Is this uh, epsilon denotes um, how often we do the randomness or explore. So 0 0.01 seems like um, uh, we would explore um, 0 0.01 times number of trials, so uh, 100 times uh, out of 10,000. So that's enough exploring, right? So when we ran this, you would see um, it's obvious from just this, looking at this, that which action was chosen the most, which is um, the last one, and last one has the most reward, so that is pretty good. And um, our uh, average, uh, our reward now average this, which is pretty close to the maximal possible. So just by using simple explore and exploit, we have improved our uh, um, gain by a lot. So it's so much better than um, uh, using a random naive strategy. So there is our curve. So we're getting pretty much close to the thing. So the more you number of trials you run, this should converge to the same number. Ultimately, you would get a maximal reward. Uh, if you do infinite trials, they would come out. So that's the idea behind um, Q tables and averages and um, reinforcement learning. So all reinforcement learning should follow a similar process. So we did ad hoc uh, our policy of how to choose. We uh, came up with this explore and exploit and we implemented it um, in a random manner like we did, but we don't know a priori what 
kind of policy to use. So, so that is the challenge of, um, uh, of a reinforcement learning setup is like, how do we decide? And um, recent advances have um, used the neural networks to be able to predict the policy. If we can give it the entire state, we can give it um, what possible actions we have to take. Maybe we can have a neural network predict that. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the idea behind uh, reinforcement learning. Let's see if we have some questions. So one of the questions uh, I'm gonna answer is from Martin Eisman. Uh, couldn't we use strategies like Marco chain or Monte Carlo or Metropolis uh, light transport sampling strategies to select the uh, arm bandit? So that's a good insight, actually. It's a great question. So in fact, what we are doing here is a form of a Markov chain implementation uh, because we are sampling from this distribution. And uh, this is exactly what happens in uh, uh, ray tracing when you do the sampling uh, for lights, um, uh, important samplings or other kinds of things. And uh, it is exactly the same thing. So it, it is a version of a Markov chain like uh, setup. So um, it's a good question, uh, great insight. Another question from uh, Martin, um, to answer live. Um, so RNNs um, not uh, use information, not just from the previous step, but from several time steps. Exactly, so I think they can use um, um, information from as many time steps as you want, uh, depending upon uh, how many um, nodes you use. So um, you can get that coherence because for things like sentences and text, um, the context can actually be fairly large. Like when somebody says a word, it would mean different things in different contexts. So you may have to go back in the sentence or the paragraph to actually discern the meaning, whether something is being said is what is being meant. So you can output things from a recurrent neural network. They don't have to be one-to-one. -one. Like we did a one-to-one -one where we had uh, N characters in and N characters out, but you can output other things. You can output something like a sentiment. So if you have enough training data, you can say that I am summarizing this paragraph and I think this paragraph is uh, positive or pre representing negative views. So your output is only like say two classes, positive or negative, for example, and you're trying to analyze the sentiment in a whole paragraph. And in that case, you have this entire context that you would feed through your RNN and try to discover context and meaning of different words and sentences placed together over multiple paragraphs. So, so you may have a lot of uh, interdependence between uh, different things. So uh, things like uh, people have done this very successfully. You can take um, uh, Rotten Tomato reviews um, and uh, select them all, whether they're positive or negative, and um, you can classify them. You can say, hey, um, this is a review somebody posted, uh, is this positive or negative? So you can get a thumbs up or thumbs down. So that's uh, something that is pretty common and um, uh, fun application of RNN. So another question about um, high dimensionality from Joshua. So, so you're right. So if you look at the number of uh, possible states and the number of actions you can take in any uh, real environment, it is very, very complex. Um, it's um, in our case, um, the possible action was to pull the lever and that is all we had to do. And that is fairly small, but imagine if you are playing a game of um, space invaders. So in space invaders, you got to move the lever uh, left or right, and you have also have a choice to shoot. And um, so that's uh, three possible actions. And um, it, it's a fairly simple game with the three possible actions and each state is uh, how the game reacts to your actions. So you can take that as input and try to uh, predict what next action you should take. 
and and that um, is slightly more complex and then as you go into like say walking then how do you model that um, what makes uh, people walk what are the joints um, active um, because we don't do these things consciously a lot of things are happening behind the intent of walking and placing of the legs and then the signals being uh, sent to the brain uh, and the nerves how are all these things happening it's hard to model that possible number of states and the possible number of actions they can multiply and uh, that gives you um, um, like a lot of issues if you try to solve it manually and people have tried that people have tried to kind of model how humans walk in a more um, kind of a policy like way but it's hard because we fail to take into account all the possible small things that can go wrong and we know that if we can just feed the data to the neural network it can tell us what action to take next it may still not be able to tell what is happening inside the brain and the muscles but it will at least it's very good at telling us what to do next. So, so that's the uh, application of neural networks to kind of help us find the next possible actions. Excellent question. So um, you guys are paying attention, so that's good. Go back to our lecture. So that's uh, probably mostly what I want to cover about this. Um, um, we had the... Um, idea like what um, Joshua was mentioning we can use a, a neural network to find out and learn Q which is our policy uh, what action to take and uh, DQN uh, is uh, something uh, that is uh, part of many neural network libraries now and they you can apply one of these things to um, to some uh, of these examples so I'll show you one example about um, walking uh, where do we go this is from Google. Um, they have this DeepMind um, set up where a lot of engineers and scientists are working on these things. So this is a robot learning to walk. And um, it stumbles and falls, but then their reward setup is such that it uh, tries to overcome all those stumbles and walks. And uh, these joints are physically modeled um, in a way um, that are almost real. Uh, so that helps. So physical modeling, the true physics-based modeling in a reinforcement learning environment is important if you want to actually figure things out for uh, physical use. So this can be used to, for example, train robots and you would, and you can easily, not easily, but it's easier than modeling humans is to model robots because you know all the um, gears and uh, electronics that are set up so you know exactly how it moves on what input so you can train robots virtually first and then you can use the things that you learn to actually deploy them in real life so that's a good application of reinforcement learning is to train robots to do different things so here are other examples of different kinds of uh, setups so again these are simple setups these are physics based setups that are um, done to train these creatures and objects to learn to do different things. So. But they all work on the same principle like the 10 arm bandit thing that we described. Um, so over time, so as you can see, this, these things take a long, long time to learn. And uh, we haven't found yet um, a good way to combine learnings uh, can I train this halfway and I, can I train something else halfway and then can they both learn from each other? Uh, that is a hard part. That is the research is still ongoing and that is the holy grail of reinforcement learning is to save the learning and then transfer it to something else. Um, and we can do it for very similar things, but it's hard for us to, in general, transfer the learning from one to the other. So humans, on the other hand, we can keep our training alive for a long time and we can learn by looking at others, by doing things. So that's truly possible. So, but this is a good step towards um, making things learn. And one example of the virtual environment like this is we can do these experiments and let them run for days and weeks. So it's not like a baby trying to learn in seven months. We can try to do this 
pretty quickly um, if we let it run for a while on the computers. All right, so that's one example. So um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of um, how to set up a more complex examples, but I am not gonna go through the process of actually doing it because it will take a while and it will introduce several new concepts that um, we don't have the machinery for yet. So a um, lot of the setups come from something called OpenAI. So OpenAI is a different organization. It's a nonprofit organization that is uh, at the forefront of um, reinforcement learning and they have made available something called a gym. Uh, a gym is essentially a setup for an environment and they have different environments set up that you can um, invoke by using this. And um, we are bringing that environment inside of uh, this collab. Uh, so all you have to do is import this gym and um, we can monitor the gym by saying monitor and uh, that's all. So, so the way to run the environment is um, you reset it first to start from the clean slate and um, every environment would have um, an action space, uh, which is uh, what is the list of possible actions I can take. And then for some number of trials, you sample from the action space. So um, you are, so instead of kind of, this is where actual, um, algorithm would be put in. So instead of taking a sampling means take a random action basically. So you're taking a random action from the action space and um, you are taking a step in the environment using this action. And once you take that action, you are given a reward and you are given an observation which just puts you into the next state. So essentially you're gonna take an action, get a reward, make an observation, take another action. So in this case, we are taking random actions. Uh, this is the part that you would replace with a neural network to figure out what action to take. So we're not doing that, we're just taking random actions here. So just to show you what it entails. So it's um, a simple setup. We printed the action space. There are six possible actions in this uh, game. And um, so, and then once you do the thousand actions, we can, um, we have saved the observation. So out of each observation, we can get a frame of the video and uh, save that out. So um, all these results went into this and we are going to make a movie out of it and play that movie. So um, essentially each of the state is a big, and this um, gun at the lower uh, part is moving randomly. So. Um, because we are taking random actions and shooting randomly. So that's, uh, so we're gonna die quickly, but that's the setup. So then the goal is to um, fill in this, which action to take instead of a random action, you would put in a neural network uh, uh, with the state and the space and each observation goes back into the neural network as well. And you would train it, uh, get the action until this, action that it takes is um, becomes um, good enough so that your reward is maximized over the long run. So, so that's the goal um, of setting this up in uh, this way. Right, so that's um, all I wanted to cover about um, uh, reinforcement learning. So I know you would have questions because you want to try these things out and it's pretty, remarkable that we can learn these complex things. Um, and we are learning it in an image-based way. So this is not a physical setup. So we are sending images, getting back images. So, so this is perfectly suited for something like a CNN. We are not using the gameplay code or mechanics and how things are set up. All we're saying sending is images, 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 one after the other of a sample run of the game. All right, so this is um, again from uh, DeepMind from Google. So this is, again, nothing too fancy here. It's just learned to play and it's playing automatically. It's getting a fairly high score. And uh, I think they have trained it to an expert player level and it is possible to even better that. 
And you may have seen other examples like AlphaGo, which is now able to beat the top players in the Go game. Uh, it is also trained using uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so, and then one thing to worry about is this is an example I found from the internet. So this particular game was trained uh, with reinforcement learning. Uh, you can see the reward structure is a um, little bit messed up. Uh, so it has learned to just move around in this circle forever and collect the reward from destroying these ships, even at the cost of destroying itself by hitting against the spear. So um, it's pretty funny. It kind of exposes the reward policy of your game. So this would basically sit here and keep uh, moving around in this ellipse collecting the reward because it's a slight gain in the reward and it, that would be the maximal policy it has. So it's not exploring the rest of the game at all anymore. So, so that's something to bear in mind to your reward structure is set up. So most of the things you would find on the internet to play with reinforcement learning, they're carefully designed environments, pretty nice and safe. Uh, but if you were to design your own environment, it's just a big task and a hard job. So Keep in mind what the reward policy should be. Okay, so now we're coming to an end. Um, summarize quickly what is um, we covered uh, throughout the nine uh, set of uh, lectures. Um, we covered a lot of stuff and uh, I want to leave this summary in the slide deck so you can keep that with you. And um, I'm not going to read this and repeat it, but just for reference for uh, next time. So a lot of things um, to uh, think about uh, as a practical matter, what to do, how to set up things. L2 is the least squared loss and L1 is the mean average error. Uh, different kinds of hyperparameters to tune, what to do with plotting and uh, uh, the efficient data system for TensorFlow. Uh, remember things about distribution that you're always trying to find a sample from the distribution. And above all, work like a scientist. Make an hypothesis, do the experiment, observe it, record it, change things, and repeat. So you don't want to start changing things ad hoc just in the hopes of getting a good result. If you get a good result the first time, it only means that you got lucky. Um, you uh, will learn from uh, successful experiments, but you learn more from failed experiments. So when things don't work is when you try to fix them and learn more. So, uh, do very methodical changes, like try to figure out like why am I changing this and what effect it might have. Try to predict that first uh, and then experiment it and observe it. So work like a scientist, be very thorough and keep a record of all the things. Make the graphs of your losses, uh, keep a track of um, how things are going with validation. So, so all those things, you want to keep that in mind as a practical matter. And um, a lot of things we did not cover. Um, main thing um, we sh could have covered, but we didn't have time for is uh, something uh, about the cloud-based learning uh, and training and deployment. And um, um, I think it's become popular because it's easy to set up. In fact, we are in the cloud in this collab environment, um, but it's not the traditional cloud environment where you connect to online databases, upload your data, and then you start up um, a session um, with the machines that you need and connect your model to the database that you uploaded your data to and do the training. And then, so that's the training part. And then you deploy also via the web through the cloud using some Kubernetes or some other way where you are not like um, asking people to run a program, but you are asking them to query something online through the cloud by sending in an example and you get the result back. So it's there in the cloud running with multiple instances of your deployment. So all those things are important in a big practical setup. So that is something you can learn. It's basically worth the class of its own. Um, we didn't talk about local environments and how to run this thing on a local machine. If you have a nice uh, 2080 Ti or some newer RTX machines, uh, can probably run all of these at um, home. Uh, we didn't talk about TensorBoard, which um, I think we should have, but um, maybe you can read up on it. So TensorBoard is part of TensorFlow. 
it allows you for logging of the losses and looking at some other visualization of weights. So if you get a chance, read up on this. So the reason we didn't do TensorBoard is because our environment is kind of a little bit uh, transient, things go away. So TensorBoard is a way for you to keep track of your experiments uh, forever. So if you're running locally, you can save those out and you can compare day-to-day -day runs. You can let things run for days at a time and still have TensorBoard keep track of all the logs. So read up on TensorBoard and I think it's a good, a good thing. If we didn't do intermediate layer visualization. What do these weights look like? What do they mean? Uh, what um, is the right thing to see and optimize? Um, we didn't cover some of the other methods that are popular, uh, something called random forest or gradient boosting. So look up these terms, uh, see what they do. Because 80% of the work that is going on in machine learning in practical deployment is uh, simple logistic regression. So uh, there are fewer neural networks than you would uh, believe because neural networks get all the press, but the actual work people are doing are simple forecasting, with um, uh, non-linear regression uh, through logistic regression. And that is what 80, 60 to 80% of people are doing that as a practical matter with large databases of the data they have collected over time. So neural networks are something newer. Um, not many people are using it in actual deployment, but it's gaining more. So random forest and XGBoost are, are other methods people have used in the past and they are pretty successful. They work very differently from neural networks, um, worth looking at what they are. Then uh, what to do next? Uh, there are some resources I have put down. Um, you can uh, read the book and this is uh, the book I'm talking about. Uh, I hope you can see it here. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the nicest books I uh, have read on the topic. It has everything that uh, I covered, but in more detail, in more math and more theory. And it's freely available on this website, along with lectures and slides. And there are other books on statistics and reinforcement learning and uh, some videos. So this uh, site, um, three blue, one brown, I think I found them to be very nice explanations of uh, not just uh, machine learning, but a lot of other things as well. So uh, give it a try, see what it uh, looks like. So this brings us to the end. Uh, I think what I would like us, um, first of all, I want to thank um, SIGGRAPH and uh, Emily, Laura, and Tim uh, for working behind the scenes of uh, helping us uh, connect every other day for the last three weeks. And... Uh...